Among the many passages of the Old Testament that provide support for the doctrine of the Trinity, like Genesis 1.26, 3.22, and 11.7, which we've already looked at, is Genesis 19.24, which says, The Lord caused to rain on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Just on the face of it, this passage appears to point to the activity of more than one personal agent, one of whom rains down fire from the other, both of whom are identified as Lord. What appears to be the case is not just an idiosyncrasy of the English translation. In Hebrew, the divine name rendered Lord in English, but Yahweh in the Hebrew text occurs twice, once at the start of the verse, thus emphasizing the divine cause of the disaster, and then again at the end of the verse as the object in a prepositional phrase. As such, the grammar and syntax clearly indicates a subject-object distinction. Yahweh reigned from Yahweh, and thus demarcates two persons or agents who properly bear the divine name. The distinction in view here is further borne out by the context, which begins back in chapter 18, where we're told of three men who appeared to Abraham. In the ensuing narrative, one of the men turns out to be the Lord, Yahweh, verses 13, 14, 17, and so on. And the other two, after their departure to Sodom, are identified as angels in Genesis 19.1 and 19.15. In the course of his conversation with Abraham, the Lord first tells him in verses 9 through 15 that he's going to give him a son. And then in verses 16 through 21, he announces his intention to go down to Sodom and judge it for the outcry that has come up to heaven. Between the time of this announcement in chapter 18 and the time of the Lord's appearance in Sodom in chapter 19, the two angels depart and Abraham intercedes with the Lord to spare Sodom if there are at least ten righteous people in the city. Verse 33 concludes by saying that the Lord then departed from Abraham. In other words, the Lord left for Sodom, where the two angels had already gone on ahead of him. The upshot is this. When the Lord appears again in chapter 19, and we're told in verse 24 that he rained fire and brimstone from the Lord from heaven, the distinction drawn is between someone on earth called Yahweh, the same person who appeared in human form and spoke to Abraham, and someone who remained unseen in heaven, also called Yahweh, the one who poured out the fire. To state it simply, Yahweh on earth called down the fire from Yahweh in heaven. This passage is only one of many Old Testament verses that distinguishes between more than one divine person. For example, in Hosea 1.7, the Lord says, I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. Just as the Lord rained fire from the Lord in Genesis 19.24, Hosea 1.7 says the Lord would save Judah by the Lord their God. Corresponding to this, Zechariah 2.8-11, the Lord repeatedly says that in the future, the Lord is going to send him to save his people and dwell in their midst. For thus says the Lord of hosts, After glory he has sent me against the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I will wave my hand over them, so that they will be plunder for their slaves. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become my people. Then I will dwell in your midst, and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Once again, just as the Lord rained fire from the Lord in Genesis 19.24, Zechariah 2.8-11 says that the Lord will send the Lord. There are other passages of this sort in the Old Testament, but most significant relevant to the distinction made by Moses in Genesis 19.24 are those passages in later prophets where the Lord himself refers back to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and refers to the agency of their downfall. In every case, the distinction made by Moses in Genesis 19.24 is perpetuated by the Lord himself through a later prophet. For example, in Isaiah 13.17-19, the Lord says, 
Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them, who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. And their bows will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb, nor will their eye pity children. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. As in Genesis 19.24, where Moses said, The Lord destroyed the cities of the plain by raining down fire from the Lord, so here the Lord speaks about God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. The same thing is seen in Jeremiah 50.40, where the Lord says, As when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah with its neighbors, declares the Lord, no man will live there, nor will any son of man reside in it. Once again, when the Lord, the speaker, refers to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he attributes it to God. A final example is seen in Amos 4, 10 through 11, where it is written, I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Here the Lord tells the people that he is the one who brought disaster upon them for their sin, and the disaster he brought upon them was like when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. A Trinitarian interpretation then of Genesis 19.24, agrees with the grammar and syntax of the verse, as well as the wider context and the panoply of Scripture. In light of all this, contrary to the ill-informed canard that Christians are guilty of reading a later Trinitarian understanding back into the Old Testament, it isn't surprising that ancient Jews prior to the Talmudic rabbis, the latter of whom made every endeavor to suppress it, also interpreted Genesis 19.24 as a reference to two divine persons. For example, the Targum of Onkelos actually accentuates the distinction already found in the Hebrew text of Genesis 19.24 when it paraphrases the verse as follows, And the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from before the Lord from the heavens, and destroyed those cities and all the plain, and all the dwellers in the cities and the herbage of the earth. More tellingly, the fragmentary Targum makes the same point by speaking of the first person called Yahweh in the Hebrew text as the Memra, the word of the Lord, and the second person simply as the Lord. And the word of the Lord himself had made to descend upon the people of Sodom and Gomorrah showers of favor that they might work repentance from their wicked works. But when they saw showers of favor, they said, So our wicked works are not manifest before him. Then he, that is the word, turned and caused to descend upon them bitumen and fire from before the Lord from the heavens. This paraphrase, where the first occurrence of Yahweh in the Hebrew text is interpreted in the Targum as a reference to the word of the Lord, is one that we've already seen can be found throughout the Jewish Targums. The Targums frequently identify the Word as God, while at the same time distinguishing him from another person who is also called God. So frequently and clearly is this the case that one could not be faulted if in an effort to summarize what the Targums say about the Word, he did so by declaring, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In conclusion, based on an analysis of the grammar, syntax, and the context, as well as the reinforcement it receives elsewhere in the prophets, all of which was recognized by the vast majority of Jews prior to the post-Christian rabbis, Genesis 19.24 clearly refers to two divine persons, and thus joins its witness to Genesis 1.26, 3.22, and 11.7, which we've already looked at, and many more passages to come. Indeed, in the next video, we'll see yet further evidence of personal plurality in the Godhead from the book of Genesis.